Hello, tonight we're going to talk about linguistic phonetics, and that's chapter two in your book. So you've already gotten kind of an overview in chapter one about clinical phonetics, and now we're going to get to the more specific information, um, so the fun stuff. Okay, so let's start. Overall, there's an estimate of anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 different languages in our world. That's a lot. And what we're going to talk about is a system in which you can actually transcribe any one of those languages using one alphabet. And that's what the International Phonetic Alphabet does. It allows us to, um, to transcribe any sound we hear and anyone around the world using the International Phonetic Alphabet will be able to understand what that word sounds like. Okay, so before we get there, we have a lot of uh, terminology and different steps we have to go through um, and definitely some training before that can happen. So let's start there. Speech and language are very complex um, and that's probably the understatement of the year. Uh, when we're talking about speech today, we're talking about the patterns of movements of s the speech organs as well as the pattern of acoustic uh, vibration. And when we're talking about, today we're going to talk mostly about spoken language, but of course there are sign language where you're not using the spoken word, um, and so that increases the amount of languages we have as well. For spoken language, it's essential to who we are um, in our cultures. Speech allows us to develop a really powerful bond with others. Um, so we get to communicate with others, and we do that um, in our cultures, in our communities, and people recognize our speech, and sometimes they can, even by our speech, recognize where we live. So that's where we start talking about um, when people live close together geographically and they need to speak to one another, they tend to use a common language, okay? And the speech community, that's going to be a group of people living in, within a geographic boundary of each other who are also using the same language. Now, to break that down even further, you're going to have your dialects. So that's going to be a difference of pronunciation, vocabulary, etc. And then you have regional dialects, which break it down even more. So, for instance, um, I'm from Michigan, so I would have a more Midwestern dialect. Uh, so characteristics of that might be um, our speech is a little bit more nasal. Uh, sometimes we drag out our O's. Um, whereas when I moved to Tennessee, there's a lot different dialect here. So I would say the I's are dragged out much longer. There's not as much nasal speech here. Um, so that's your dialect can be determined by your region. Now granted, even though I'm from Michigan, I've definitely picked up some um, characteristics of Tennessee dialect as well. So you can adapt based on where you're living and, and pick up different regional dialects, but it's usually based on geographically where you live and the people that you're communicating with. And then an idio dialect is gonna be uniquely to just you. So that is how your speech patterns distinguish, uh, it's how speech patterns distinguish us as individuals. So it's how your world has influenced your speech specifically. And if we go to slide three, see if my computer wants to work. Okay, now let's talk about morphemes. So a morpheme is a minimal unit of meaning. It's the smallest unit that changes the meaning or semantics of words. So we're talking about um, prefixes, suffixes, sometimes tense endings, plurals. So I want to give you an example because this takes some examples, I think, to understand what it means. So in the word cat, we have one morpheme. 
but if I make it plural and add an S, so cats and add that S, S changes the meaning of cat to a plural form and therefore that S is adding an additional uh, morpheme. So there are now two morphemes in that. Cat and then the S for the plural together making cats. There's two morphemes in that word. Okay, let's try another one. For instance, in the word touch, we can add the morpheme ed, and it's going to become touched. It changes it to the past tense. So we go from the present to the past. So those morphemes are changing. It, they're just small units, um, but they're changing the meaning of the word just because we've added that small um, that small change to the word. Now let's talk about morphology. So morphology is simply the study of morphemes. Pretty easy, right? Um, and when we're using morphemic transcription, it's typically to help us analyze um, a language sample from a child, for instance. So let's say I have a child who has difficulty um, with past tense verbs or even plurals or possessives. Whatever I want to do uh, or whatever I want to track, I can use morphemic transcription to get a very clear picture of what morphemes are they using, which ones are they using incorrectly. So this is really helpful as far as a language aspect, not only um, you know, is transcription helpful for the actual phonemes that they're using um, and the speech aspect, but it also helps the language. So um, it's kind of, it offers a dual role in that instance. Let's get some examples um, and some practice. So in the word tractors, we're adding an S and that would make it plural. So if, we're ha if we have tractor, we're adding an S. Now we have tractors, that's, that's going to be plural. You can also look at boy and hood. If we combine those two words and say boyhood, that's going to be um, two morphemes coming together, creating a different word. The same thing with cloudy, we're adding the Y at the end to cloud. Standing, so we go from stand to standing. That's changing the form of the verb. Um, dress and maker, when we add those together and get dressmaker, uh, that's changing the word based on adding that morpheme. Okay, now I want you to stop the video and I want you to take some time to go through these eight words and I want you to practice. So show me where each morpheme is. Where do you break it? to get the, the um, smallest unit of language. And then once you're finished, come back and restart the video, okay? All right, so hopefully you practiced. Let me know if you have any questions with those words. We're gonna move on now to morphemes. So, um, I'm sorry, we already talked about morphemes. We're gonna move on to phonemes. So. Morphemes, if those are the smallest unit of language, morphemes are going to be the smallest unit of sound. Okay, so very different. We talked about transcription can help both in language and in speech. Now we're going to talk about the speech portion. Okay, do note the word at the bottom of the page on page seven in your books. Um, and I am talking about the second paragraph. There's a little note at the bottom. Be sure to look at that because that sometimes can be confusing when you're first learning. So I'm going to have you look at that on your own. Um, let's look at some of these words uh, with cat, mat, fat, rat, bat, pat, vat, and hat. The only thing that's different about those words is the very initial sound or the very initial phoneme. So remember, we're talking about sounds, not graphemes. Um, when we're using graphemes, that is a sound 
um, or excuse me, that's going to be the alphabetic letter, uh, how we write it, okay? So that would be like our A, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. The difference with phonemes is it's not necessarily how we write it, although some are the same, like this sound, B, it does have the letter B, but there are a lot of sounds that are different and have unique symbols. So be very careful when you're looking at uh, when you're looking at phonemes that you're not just using the grapheme that goes with it. We talked about this in earlier in chapter one, but for instance, if I'm using um, car and circus, so they both start with a C. If we're talking about the grapheme or the alphabetic letter written, however, the k and car would be a K sound, and then the uh, the C in circus, it actually makes the S sound, so the S, okay? So be careful there because that's where it can really trip you up. Um, and then what we're going to do is, uh, with the minimal contrast down at the bottom, this is the last point on your slide, those are going to be the smallest differences between your phonemes. So that's when um, you're contrasting between two morphemes, and they're only differing by one sound. So for instance, with that whole list, cat, mat, fat, rat, those are minimal contrasts. They are only changing by one phoneme, okay? There's only one phoneme that's different, and that's the initial one. And we'll keep talking about that in a minute. Okay, now on to the International Phonetic Alphabet. Um, I talked about this a little bit earlier in this video. It was established in Paris in 1886. How cool is that? It's been around for a long time. It has um, gone through lots of changes since then, but it has stayed consistent in allowing us to represent any language in the world and know what sounds a certain word makes or um, a group of words. So it's pretty remarkable and I absolutely love phonetics. So I'm really excited to start getting into actual transcription because I think it's a lot of fun. Um, let me give you some background about IPA. So I already talked about it was introduced in the late 1880s. We have 107 symbols that represent all the world's consonants and vowels. So 107. We have 31 diacritics. Those are going to be mar uh, specific marks to identify modifications to the sounds. We have 19 sounds for super segmental qualities. We will also talk about this later in the semester, but that has to do with tone, stress, and intonation. Um, and then, let's see here, when we are using um, phonemes, so the International Phonetic Alphabet has phonemes, and each of those phonemes, when we represent them, we put them in slash marks. And the reason we do that is to distinguish it from the graphemes. So if I put a slash P slash, that's going to represent the P sound not necessarily the grapheme P, okay? Especially when we get to the S's, the C's, the K's. Um, when you get to those graphemes, it's going to be really helpful to make sure you put those slash marks because it can be very different. Um, let's see. Now to the fun part. Let's go. So now I'm on slide 8, phonology and phonetics. So when we talk about phonology, it's simply the sound, uh, the study of sound systems of languages. We're looking at the structure and the function of sounds in those languages. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about the different parts. So um, we have articulatory, that's going to be uh, phonetics, and that is the uh, how sounds are formed. We have the acoustic phonetics, and that's the acoustic properties of those sounds. And then clinical phonetics 
And that's, those are the sounds that are of concern for SLPs and audiologists. Um, so the phonetic symbols are placed within brackets when we're talking about um, whole words. What we're going to do is if we transcribe a single phoneme, we're going to use the slash marks. And then when we mo move into whole word transcription, we're going to use the brackets like you see in the word cat. Um, and the word cat there, you can see what it looks like in IPA. If you look in your book on page, what page is that? On page 8, um, in the second column, it shows you how you break down each of those sounds. So that can be really helpful. And the last page. So I want to talk very briefly about placements and voicing. When we're talking about a word, we have initial, medial, and final position of words. So I'm going to use a really simple word. So in the word cat, we were just talking about that, um, you'll see in the initial position, there is a K. Initial position simply means the very beginning sound, the first sound in the word. And then if we're looking at the final sound in the word, the final consonant is going to be the sound at the end of the word. So in the word cat, it's going to be the T, the T sound, okay? And then if we're talking about medial sounds, that's going to be the consonant that's in the middle of the word. So for instance, in cat, we don't have a medial sound, or excuse me, sound. However, in the word calm, as you see there, that L is the medial uh, consonant, the consonant in the middle. We also have pre-vocalic and post-vocalic sounds, uh, or excuse me, consonants. So when we're talking about a pre-vocalic consonant, that simply is going to be a consonant before a vowel. So in this instance with cat, again, the K comes before a vowel, the K sound, the K comes before the A, and so that's going to be a pre-vocalic sound. When we use that same word, a post-vocalic sound, so a sound coming after a vowel, a consonant after a vowel, it is going to be the T, the T sound. So hopefully that makes sense. Let me know if you have questions there. Last thing I want to talk about, there are two types of syllables. So you know what syllables are in the word cat, it's cat, one syllable. If we're talking about um, kitchen, kitchen, two syllables. However, there are two types of syllables. So the first is going to be open syllables, and that basically is just a syllable that doesn't end in a consonant. And then a closed syllable is going to be a syllable that ends in a consonant, okay? Um, any questions with this section? I'm just going to kind of wrap it up here. Feel free to post in the discussion board under Chapter 2, and don't forget your Chapter 2 quiz. All right, thank you.